Thank you. That was that was a nice introduction. I uh, uh, it's great to be here. Great to actually get to do an in-person seminar uh, again. Uh, and uh, yes, I guess I don't talk into the microphone. Where you can you guys can hear me? Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today are uh, indeed, as the title indicates, trends in hiring discrimination against racial and ethnic minorities in uh, six Western countries. Uh, and this is work that's uh, uh, co-authored with uh, John Lee, who's uh, a, a recent PhD from Northwestern Sociology. Uh, and so um, what I'm really going to be looking at, I guess you could think about is, is a specific domain of kind of changes in uh, the significance of race. Uh, and I think of there as being a kind of a period in the post-war uh, period during which um, open discrimination uh, came to be viewed as kind of normatively unacceptable. Uh, the defeat of Nazi Germany discredited a lot of ideas about biological racism. Uh, and both during World War II and the Cold War, uh, Western countries uh, sort of claimed that they had superiority in certain ways uh, due to relatively democratic and inclusive systems. But that was contradicted by a lot of things about the treatment of racial and ethnic uh, minority groups. Uh, so that brought forward kind of uh, uh, a, a discourse of uh, uh, anti-discrimination. Freedom from discrimination was declared a universal human right uh, in international law uh, in uh, sort of the late 40s. And then there were resolutions passed by UNESCO and also the International Labor Organization in the 1950s and 1960s denouncing uh, discrimination in the labor market. Uh, and declaring freedom from discrimination as a universal human right. Uh, and discrimination was made illegal in national laws in the U.S. in the 1960s. And in most Western European countries' national laws, it was uh, made illegal in the uh, early 1970s, although it depends on the country. Some countries didn't make it illegal until quite a bit later. Um, but, you know, one thing that we know quite clearly is that race-ethnic discrimination persists in all Western countries. Um, this is indicated probably most clearly by field experiments of discrimination, uh, where mock applications are made for jobs, for housing, sometimes for other types of commercial transactions, uh, and uh, things are kind of manipulated to be the same in the applications, uh, and uh, except there are clues of the race or ethnicity of the person uh, and comparison of outcomes for the uh, applicant with the white clues and the applicant with the non-white clues uh, in, uh, usually indicate discrimination. And I have a paper that actually looked at field experiments of hiring across a bunch of different countries. Uh, and I would say there's a general pattern that um, every country has race and ethnic discrimination uh, in hiring against uh, minority groups. White minority groups experience less discrimination than non-white groups, but they, white ethnic minorities also do experience uh, discrimination as well. So um, the question that I'm going to be looking at today is, uh, have we made progress in reducing discrimination in recent decades, focusing, focusing specifically on uh, hiring? And um, there's reasons why you mo might think that discrimination has declined. Uh, and, uh, you know, one kind of classic theory that has been offered up in sociology and also has forms kind of in, in economics and other disciplines uh, is modernization theory. Um, these were theories that suggested there would be a, a decline in the importance of descriptive bases for social stratification and a growing importance of achieved bases for social stratification. The achieved bases were especially put a lot of emphasis on the growing importance of education and educational credentials and the idea that there was less kind of direct status transmission from parents to children and also less importance of ascriptive characteristics like uh, race and gender over time. And this was seen uh, in part as a result of things like uh, bureaucratic personnel systems becoming more refined uh, and them tending to use these kind of formal criteria like education uh, and putting less uh, role on kind of direct descriptive processes in who they gave jobs and positions to. Um, uh, and this was usually viewed as a as a fairly linear kind of process or a process that at least was going to be progressive over time uh, as societies became more modern. Um, <clears throat> there's also sort of more detailed evidence uh, in the domains of race and ethnicity, some of which lines up with modernization theory that suggests that we 
uh, should have seen declining discrimination. On surveys, there's been declines in a survey, white endorsement of opinions on surveys that have sometimes been called traditional prejudice or open supportive discrimination. Uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s, many white respondents in the US would endorse statements like that whites should get first priority for jobs. Uh, and support for that type of statement has declined precipitously uh, over time. Um, the, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, there's also evidence that there's been somewhat similar trend, although it's varied somewhat depending on the country. Uh, but there's definitely some evidence that uh, uh, there has been a decline in open support of uh, discrimination uh, in uh, Western European countries, although the, the evidentiary basis is a lot thinner because there's much less survey data that is specifically that asks questions on race or ethnicity or that kind of thing over time. Um, there's been strengthening of legal frameworks against discrimination. Uh, in the U.S. especially, there was a, a strengthening of tort law or of uh, the rules that made it more favorable for plaintiffs in discrimination cases, particularly a notable reform in 1991. Uh, and in the European Union, um, there was a, an, an inequality directive that was passed by the European Union in 2000 and which required many member states in the European Union to make changes in their national laws regarding uh, discrimination. They were required to actually have, make it illegal uh, to discriminate based on race or ethnicity and hiring and also in um, housing uh, for uh, a number of, of, for countries that had not already passed that into law. And there were also a series of reforms that required about things like burden of proof that were changed to make it uh, generally to the favor of people claiming discrimination or making it a little more likely they could win discrimination lawsuits or complaints. Um, finally, there's been a trend of uh, large employers creating diversity bureaucracies. Uh, so these are uh, HR departments that oversee hiring and that pay some attention to try and have, to have a diverse workforce, to have a workforce in a way that looks like the customers of the different countries uh, of the large employers. Uh, and um, so the, uh, uh, this includes things like uh, uh, diversity training, uh, but also mentoring programs and a variety of other uh, uh, programs that have been <clears throat> designed to try to increase uh, diversity in hiring for uh, larger employers. Um, so, okay, so that's the story. Those are some of the reasons you might have thought that discrimination would go down over time or that there's been a decline. Um, but there's also actually, you can make plausible cases too, that there are things that might have increased discrimination in Western societies across the time. Um, one of these is that, uh, you know, there's a, a series of uh, attitudinal studies that have pointed out that things like the decline in traditional prejudice don't track across all types of different items about race or ethnicity, uh, that um, there may be more subtle forms of racism that have taken place of kind of the very open forms of discrimination. Uh, and that if you look at survey questions that ask about things like stereotypes of different racial and ethnic groups, those have shown much less change over time uh, than is case for uh, uh, these traditional prejudice type of uh, items. So this potential rise in subtle forms of racism, and there are a variety of kind of theories of this sometimes called new racism theories uh, suggest that in some sense there's just been uh, uh, racism in some sense has gone underground uh, and has become less obvious rather than really going away. But that in terms of hiring discrimination, maybe it hasn't really changed that much. Um, there's some evidence too that there's been increasing hostility, especially toward immigrants uh, in uh, Europe and to some degree in the US, but the data is clearer in Europe. Uh, from 1988 to 94, there were <clears throat> attitudes questions in European surveys that asked about ratings of immigrants or thoughts about immigrants showed a kind of growing hostility toward immigrants and the desire to cut down immigration, uh, from, especially from 88 to 94. Um, and finally, there's been growing electoral support for far right populist parties in Europe. Uh, and um, so if you look at, uh, if you look at the graph that I put up here, there's, um, Share of votes, these are in European elections for uh, left conservative and far right parties. And you can see the, the steady increase in the share of the vote that's gone to far right parties in European elections. 
Um, in the United States, of course, we had Donald Trump elected. And in some ways, you can see uh, Trump as a capturing of the Republican Party by uh, far right elements. Uh, and um, <clears throat> these groups have often been kind of very uh, anti-immigrant and have cast uh, non-white immigrants in particular as threats to kind of national identities. Oh, sure. No, no, just use the mouse. Oh, just use the, the mouse to I see, get rid of this. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so there's a, a story you could make too about how discrimination might have actually gone up over time as well. Um, and so it's a little bit unclear how things like uh, changes in, in elections or politics might be linked to the particular decisions that employers are making at any point in time, which are going to be my focus, but you could imagine there uh, may be some connection. So uh, another story that you could, you could tell is that there might be selective increases in uh, discrimination. So perhaps against particular target groups, uh, particular uh, minority groups. Um, so there's maybe some evidence from all of the what I just summarized that there could be more discrimination targeted, particularly at immigrant minority groups. Uh, and um, in Europe, there's been a lot of focus too on the possibility of rising discrimination against uh, Muslim uh, immigrants or Muslim minority groups, majority Muslim minority groups. Uh, so um, in part, this could be directly response to kind of terrorism by Islam Islamic extremists, like the September 11th attacks, uh, attacks in Europe by Al Qaeda and the Islamic State that followed from uh, the uh, that follows September 11th. Um, in Europe, there have long been uh, concerns that religious Muslim immigrants maybe don't fit into secular European societies. Uh, and uh, that's <clears throat> a lot of uh, European literature that discusses that as a possible kind of factor uh, um, that drives discrimination in the European context. Um, you know, the intensification of the war and terror after 2001, the US invasion, of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan um, as well. Uh, could, you can see how that would kind of perhaps inflame uh, sentiments against uh, Muslim immigrants and Muslim majority immigrants. Um, and there's a highly racialized kind of character to a lot of anti-Muslim discrimination. Um, that is that, uh, of course, in the employment context, people are not usually directly indicating their religion on something like an employment application or on their, their CV. But uh, individuals that are from Muslim majority countries uh, are often discriminated against based on what you might view as race or ethnic clues uh, that make, make people think that they could be possible Muslims. Uh, and that may be justifying or uh, motivating some discrimination against them, um, especially in the context of uh, Europe. Uh, there's a lot of <clears throat> European literature and European scholars who uh, put a lot of focus on anti-Muslim sentiment as a driver of, of discrimination. Um, but there's also a lot of reasons to think about anti-Muslim discrimination in a way as uh, being a, a kind of racialized phenomena. Uh, and a lot of scholars who kind of work in the Islamophobia tradition uh, kind of talk about Islamophobia and argue that you might view it best as being like a form of racism rather than, even though Islam is definitely not a race, uh, because it's driven by clues that are, in some sense, ethnic or racial clues, uh, rather than by direct uh, religious clues. Okay, so there could be a selective increase in uh, discrimination. So I'm going to look at particularly uh, employment discrimination. Uh, and um, so these ideas that I've talked about have been, been explored somewhat in survey attitudes literature, uh, but it's been less clear in past studies, how these translate into kind of behavioral discrimination. Uh, and my focus is going to be on hiring discrimination. Um, of course, employment is an important domain uh, of race and ethnic inequality. Uh, in European societies, uh, unemployment gaps between uh, majority and minority populations are quite large. Uh, and it's viewed as kind of one of the most important dimensions of racial ethnic inequality uh, in that context. Employment decisions, of course, have real consequences both for employers and for employees. So it's a little bit of a different context than you get in surveys where there's kind of an abstracted discussion about what you think about members of different groups. Uh, and employers are on average older and whiter than the general population, kind of worth keeping that in mind. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at trends in discrimination from field experiments. 
Uh, and field experiments are studies in which fictional candidates uh, apply for real jobs, right? So uh, they're really, in a way, I'm going to mostly two types. There are in-person studies where someone goes out and hires uh, people to play job applicants, gives them fake resumes. If they're doing a good job, probably gives them some training about how to act. Uh, and then they go in and they uh, apply and they uh, very often they have one uh, white kind of native born majority person. Uh, and then they also have a minority uh, a group member and they both apply for the same jobs with fake resumes that are equivalent in terms of their qualifications. Uh, and they see what happens. Um, so uh, there are also many studies, in fact, more studies that use resumes. So instead of actually hiring people to go in and play in-person job applicants, they um, uh, just use resumes that have clues about the race or ethnicity of the people applying for the job. And the clues vary, but by far the most common clue is of the name. Uh, and uh, so the, a name that indicates uh, more likely white majority or more likely minority. Um, and especially in the European context, this can work uh, pretty well because names are a fairly clear signal. Um, as my Norwegian co-author said to me, no one's going to mistake a Norwegian name for a Pakistani name. So the names are really quite distinct and send clear uh, ethnic signals in that context. Uh, in some ways, the, the famous Bertrand and Mullenathan study, one of their kind of innovations was recognizing that they could do the same thing with white and black typed names in the United States uh, and that that could work. Uh, and indeed, they found quite a bit of discrimination using uh, white and black types uh, names, distinctive names that are distinctively associated with uh, uh, black applicants versus white applicants. So um, often there's one majority and one minority applicant per job. Job relevant characteristics are controlled to be similar across groups on average. Uh, and um, uh, in many cases, they do things like kind of maybe uh, swap, you know, which applicant gets which kind of set of background characteristics across applications. So on average, they're really very similar in their background characteristics that are relevant for getting a job. Uh, and because of the use of experimental design, these have very high validity as measures of uh, discrimination. So what I've done is I've taken um, all of the field experiments of discrimination that uh, I could find, and I've created kind of a time series of their results or a series of their results. And I'm going to use that to look at changes in discrimination across time uh, in these different contexts. So um, there are several previous studies that have done some version of this. Uh, there was a very early kind of international uh, analysis of results of field experiments that did this uh, by uh, Eva Schrindt and, uh, and Rudin, and they, they, uh, examined, um, they examined just a little bit of a trend uh, by contrasting before and after 2000 in Europe, uh, but they did it without any control for study characteristics. Um, they also have quite a small sample of experiments relative to what I'm going to talk about. They had roughly 26 field experiments of uh, discrimination they used to do their before after contrast for 2000. Um, and they also just looked at kind of majority minority. They didn't disaggregate specific minority groups in uh, looking at outcomes for the most part. Um, there are two studies that have been done that looked at trends in field experiments and hiring discrimination. <clears throat> One of them done by me, uh, and uh, those showed no real change over time in racial discrimination and hiring over the last 25 to 35 years. One of them the, was a paper I published in 2017 with uh, a series of co-authors that looked at changes in discrimination in the U.S. labor market over the last 25 years using field experiments and didn't really find much change over time. Uh, there was no change in discrimination against African Americans. There was a little bit of ambiguous evidence. There might have been declining discrimination against Latinos, but uh, the evidence was kind of borderline. It wasn't very clear. Um, there's also a, been a study that's done in the UK that looked at discrimination levels over the last 35 years by Anthony Heath and colleagues, uh, professor at Oxford. And they also found that there was no real change over time looking at the last 35 years. Um, Okay, so what I'm gonna do is in some sense, extend this kind of set of results by looking at more countries, looking at quite a bit more data uh, and um, 
the availability of more data is going to allow me to do things like look in more detail at specific minority groups and how discrimination may have changed against them across time, right? So I'm going to extend it to four different countries lacking national trend studies, Canada, France, Germany, Netherlands. I'm also going to show results for uh, Great Britain uh, and uh, for the US. Um, the other thing that we've done in our study is try to control very carefully for a large variety of other characteristics, the field experiments that may have changed over time. So for instance, field experiments now are much more likely to be do, done over the internet as opposed to being done through the postal mail if you're doing a resume study. And if that has some possible effect on um, the level of discrimination that is found, then that could potentially change results of a time series analysis, right, or of a, a comparison across time. So I'm trying to, con we control for a much broader set of study characteristics than past studies have, have done. Um, okay, so um, the data I'm gonna use is, you know, this has 93 field experiments from six countries, but I think actually the data, uh, we ended up using 90 field experiments. We excluded a few for uh, complicated reasons I could talk about in the questions if you want, but it doesn't really matter whether we have 93 or 90, uh, we get very similar results. Uh, and, um, you know, we collected all the field experiments we could. Uh, we were aiming to get all published or unpublished studies of hiring discrimination against ethnic uh, minority groups. And we did that by doing searches in bibliographic databases, by looking at the references of uh, studies that, um, uh, the references of studies that reviewed or discussed uh, employment discrimination. We also conducted an author survey where we emailed uh, authors who um, of uh, field experiments in discrimination and said, can you provide us information about any studies, published or unpublished, uh, that uh, use field experimental methods to look at discrimination? That was an effort especially to try to reduce concerns about publication bias, trying to make sure that we got a very um, full set of studies, including unpublished studies. Uh, and we did get some unpublished studies, both through the survey and through the other methods. Uh, and then in 2021, I did a, a kind of a refresh of parts of it for uh, this paper. We coded the field experiments by developing a kind of coding rubric. Uh, each study was coded by two weighted for reliability. And we also did searches uh, in uh, databases in um, several European languages. And we coded um, from those national languages, hiring people that knew those languages to do the coding for us, or in some cases on some of these papers, I had co-authors that uh, you know, spoke Dutch, for instance, and could do the coding themselves. Uh, so uh, we tried to get as complete a uh, universe as we could of field experiments that have looked at discrimination and hiring, right? Um, okay, so here are the 90 studies, as I mentioned, that we're really gonna use in this analysis. And, um, the, uh, they're listed here, the number of studies that we found in each country, and then there, what are effects? So effects is distinct from studies are, um, an effect is a discrimination estimate against a minority racial or ethnic group. So most studies or many studies include estimates of discrimination against more than one racial or ethnic target group. So that might be, for instance, against African-Americans and Latinos, right? So then a study that looked at those two groups would have two effect sizes or two discrimination estimates. And the contrast is always going to be uh, against um, the white native born population uh, persons in these different groups. Or most often that means someone who has a white native born uh, name and other things about the resume to suggest that they were probably born in that, that country, things about their education, and you know, in the European studies too, it's not that unusual to list a place of birth uh, on the resume. European resumes and job searches generally have more information than in the U.S. And it depends on the country a lot as to how much information. But um, through these other things like the cover letter uh, or the CV, there's also some extra information conveyed about things like uh, age of immigration or place of nativity. Um, okay, so in total, we have about 175,000. Uh, applications. And you can also see that the years that we really have data for, it's going to vary a fair amount by country. So come some countries, we have much longer time series for the, the uh, Great Britain. We actually have, <clears throat> uh, that's where the sort of field experiments um, using resume methods on discrimination hiring were first done. And so there's a lot of much older studies in Great Britain than there are in most other countries. Um, 
Okay, and we we coded from these specific minority racial or ethnic groups into four kind of broad categories, which are uh, uh, African or Black, Middle East, North African, Latin American, Hispanic. That's a that's a category that really just exists in the U.S. and Canada, uh, and then Asian. Um, so Asian includes both South and East Asian in this analysis, and some work we we've broken those apart. Uh, the uh, we don't have white uh, minority groups or white immigrant groups in here because there are really too few overall for us to do a good trend analysis over time. Uh, but um, so we uh, we instead are um, uh, we are just looking at non-white groups because there's not enough data against white minority groups. We also know from the other studies we've done that white minority groups experience less discrimination than non-white groups do uh, in general, though they do experience some uh, employment discrimination. Okay, so the outcome is going to be uh, this uh, discrimination ratio that we calculate for each effect size. Um, okay, and so if uh, uh, in some sense, the discrimination ratio, we calculate the proportion of applications that get a callback. So a callback is the by far most used outcome in all of these studies. And that essentially is there's a request from the employer for more information. Right. So there's a request uh, either to interview the person directly to go to the kind of next stage of considering them for the job or a request for more information about them. So if they receive a uh, uh, those one of those things, and they were counted having callback. If they either didn't get an answer, or they got a negative answer that no, we're not interested, or no, the job is no longer available, then um, that was counted as not a callback. Okay, and we uh, essentially took the study documents for these uh, ninety studies, and we coded um, the uh, number of callbacks of the total number of applications, and we created these things discrimination ratios. Um, okay, and the discrimination ratio is really going to be this ratio of the percentage of, of callbacks to the um, the white group to divided by the percentage of callbacks to the minority group. So a higher ratio indicates more discrimination. A ratio of one indicates no discrimination because the callback rate is the same for the white and minority group. Uh, and the fraction above one indicates the percentage of more responses to the majority of the minority group. So 1.5 for indicate for instance, indicates 50% more callbacks to white natives than to the uh, racial minority group. Um, okay, so then we're gonna kind of model this as an outcome. Uh, and, you know, we use all of these techniques from the, the this literature on analyzing uh, groups of experimental results from the meta-analysis literature. Uh, and this is, you know, a formal statistical set of procedures that's used, especially in medical studies where there are a lot of experiments to combine results across different experiments and to examine how they can change depending on different moderator variables. And in a way, the key moderator variable that we're really looking at here is gonna be um, year of survey or time, right? Uh, and so we, we modeled in some sense, this log outcome discrimination ratio where higher indicates more discrimination against a minority group as a function, usually just of a straight linear trend term. Sometimes we've also done things to look at nonlinearity that I could talk about. Uh, and then there's um, uh, there's a weighting of the effect size based on the estimated kind of sampling variance in estimating it. That's the ease in this. Uh, and then there's also a variance component that represents between study variability. Uh, so that's kind of capturing the effect of study level variables that are not controlled for in the models, but that affect the outcome. So in some sense, this is going to have the effect of inflating the standard errors somewhat to adjust for the fact that there are probably omitted study level factors that affect the outcome. Um, okay, and then we also control for study characteristics, although I didn't put it on the slide here, uh, and uh, I'll talk about those in a moment. Okay, so so finally, now to get to the actual data, right? Uh, the um, uh, so this is just the very first kind of look at this in a where I pooled all the data together and looked at the time trend. This is data from all six of the countries put together. So each dot indicates an effect size that is an estimate of discrimination from a study. And we have the year that the, uh, the study was in the field on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we have the discrimination ratio. So a discrimination ratio one would be no discrimination. Um, things that are below one are situations where the uh, minority group 
got more callbacks than the majority group did. You can see that happens once in a while, but it's not, not a common outcome. Uh, and it, you see this line here. So there, there's quite a bit of variability in the discrimination estimates just overall. But uh, if we just fit a simple linear trend line there, we get something that's actually very flat. It has a slope of 0.0001 up. <laughs> so that's 0.01% increase per year on average. Uh, but that in, uh, in itself, you know, seems to suggest we're not going to find a lot of change over time. And indeed, that's going to be one of the major findings, although there will be some change over time when we get into the details of things. OK, so this was this is just the uh, the data without any controls, just looking at this bivariate scatter plot in a way. Um, the size of the dot, maybe I should mention, too, is proportional to kind of the meta analysis weight, which um, is. Uh, Driven one thing that drives that is how how big the sample size of the study was. You know how many resumes did they send out and stuff like that. Um, okay, so then I add basic controls. So here I'm just adding country dummies for the six done, six countries, minority groups for the four categories, and then I add in these study characteristics variables. So that includes things like the method of the study, was it in person or done or as a resume study. The gender of the testers, were there male or female testers who were applying for these different jobs? The applicant, ed the education of the applicants in the jobs, since sometimes the fake applicants had a high school degree or equivalent, sometimes they had more like a college degree, sometimes they had some mix of those things. Um, the immigration status of the applicants, foreign born, uh, you know, were the, were the minority group signaled in the experiment as having been bar born in another country or were they born in the country that they were seeking a job in? Uh, you know, was there signaling of that? Uh, and then also things like, did were they citizens uh, or not? Uh, and did they have credentials that were not from the country? So really, this was looking at whether their highest educational credentials were from a different country. These are some things we control. Um, and this lists some of these things that a little more detail, uh, we also included a control for whether or not the jobs were online or offline. So we have, we have a set of controls that we call kind of the base controls. And then there are some additional controls that we put in uh, just in the pooled models where we have more data. Okay, we also included controls for things like occupations in some broad categories of occupations. So mostly field experiments are using um, sets of, op of uh, occupations where there are applications made to like a wide variety of different jobs by the experimenter, but they're almost all kind of entry-level jobs. They're not usually jobs that require a lot of uh, advanced experience or something like that, but uh, we include controls for occupations that are included in the, uh, um, that are included in that particular study. Okay, and so this here is just giving us the linear trend. Um, that is estimated from a set of different models. Each one of these lines is a different meta regression model. Uh, and you can see zero would be no change over time. That's the flat line. So the very first linear trend only, that's with no controls. So that's exactly what I just showed you before in that graph with the purple dots, uh, okay? And uh, you can see that was very flat, that the point estimate was very much on top of zero. Um, so then we add country and group controls. We add this series of 12 controls for study characteristics of 12 controls. So a lot of those are dummy variables. Uh, and then we also added foreign nationality and education, the local unemployment rate in the area and the percentage of people in the local area foreign born. Um, and you can see from all those different modifications, the point estimate moves around a little, but it's never statistically significant. The line that's a 95% confidence interval always includes zero. You can also see in most of those, it's positive, not negative. So if anything, there's a little more evidence of up than down. Um, and then we also, we include, then the last two lines, we uh, just looked at studies okay. that um, covered a lot of occupations. We threw out the single occupation studies because there were some studies that just looked at accountants or waiters things like that, we got rid of those. It doesn't really change things. Uh, and we also then looked just at the correspondence studies. We got rid of the in-person studies. And the result of all those is this fairly stable thing that we just don't find evidence that on average there's decline in the discrimination ratios across these six countries. So, you know, depressingly, we don't find evidence there's been decline in discrimination over time. We find more like no change. Um, okay, so that was aggregating all this stuff together, but, uh, we can then look at things separately by country. 
Um, because, you know, the, the paper I published on this before, it was very clear that country was an important kind of structuring factor in discrimination. So I wanted to break down results to look within country trends, right? That's why, in a way, we had this focus on the six countries that have enough, enough data to look within country, okay? And you can see that um, here we find uh, varying trends. Canada has just a little bit of a decline on average, but that's not a statistically significant decline. So France, of all places, um, surprisingly to me, seemed to show more decline. And you might think too, you notice there's that one dot in like about 1979 or 78 there, okay, that's real high. Maybe that's driving the line. It turns out you get rid of the dot, the line doesn't really change position much. Um, it, does, you, uh, it does change the statistical significance somewhat. It becomes less significant, that downward trend. But here, there's quite a statistically significant downward trend. If you throw out the early case, it's still downward, but it's kind of more uh, marginally significant decline over time. Okay, Germany, there's a very flat kind of trend. Great Britain, if anything, it looks like there's an up, although that's not a statistically significant increase. The Netherlands has a, a little bit of an increase. That's actually a, a statistically significant at the 0.05 level, that increase. And the USA looks flat. So there's not a lot of change over time. So this is aggregating across minority groups but looking by country. And so we come out of this with the idea that maybe there's been a decline in France and maybe there's been an increase in the Netherlands. Uh, one thing to notice too about France that I'll just mention now is um, you notice that on average, the position of the dots for France tends to be high relative to the other countries. So in some sense, the change in France looks like maybe it went from like what seemed like very high discrimination in the earlier periods. And you know the, the graph maybe is a little distorted by the fact that the data is so clustered at the right-hand side. But if you focus in on that right-hand side, you get kind of a similar story that it looks like there was higher discrimination in France than most other places in the early period. And then as you get more recent, it looks like it kind of converges toward a level that uh, is similar to other European countries or more similar to other European countries. Um, Okay, so those are the basic trends we find. So then I estimate models to where uh, we include controls and then we look at the country trends with controls. And in doing that, I constrain it that the control variables have the same slope across countries. And this is necessary because otherwise there's not enough cases in many of the countries to estimate all those controls at the same, at the same time. But I allow there to be a country specific trend and I allow there also to be differences in the residual variability across country because the data does show that there are significant differences in that across different countries. And um, okay, so here I just show the slopes again by country with no controls and then putting those controls in. And I guess I can summarize it kind of quickly by saying that putting in the controls mostly doesn't change the trends across time very much. You know, the point estimates are still the same. Sometimes because there's a uh, uh, because the standard errors get bigger, we, we don't have statistically significant trends where we had them before, but we still get a fairly similar pattern of change across the different countries. And France is the only country where it looks like there's evidence there may have been decline. And as I noted, that's kind of declined from super high level of discrimination to, to just kind of high or you know similar to countries like Great Britain. Um, okay, so a, another interesting dimension to look at are by the race or ethnic target group. Um, and so here I've broken it down, combining across different countries, but looking at the four different uh, minor, more sort of minority groups or you know <clears throat> continental origin groups that I've created. <clears throat> and you can see for African black, there's a very flat line with very little change over time. For Asian, again, there's quite a flat line over time. I should note too that Asian here is more predominantly South Asian than East Asian in terms of this data, but it's a mix of both together. Latin American Hispanic, you know, in my earlier paper, I found some evidence of decline, but when I put in a little more data here, um, it, that little bit of decline kind of went away and it looks more just flat. Uh, and then uh, Middle Eastern, North African. So here that's, there's a little bit of an increase in the line, but it's not statistically significant. Um, okay. and um, looking at putting in controls, again, doesn't really change uh, the results very much. Here, there's kind of three different sets of controls. In some models, I was able to um, put in controls that allow the controls to vary by group, unlike with the national models. 
And um, you can see the controls really don't, don't change the story you see in the descriptive graphs very much. But one thing that is worth um, focusing on, maybe I realized when inspecting the graphs in the data is the Middle East, North Africa uh, group and the apparent increase that seemed to be there for them. That, um, you know, it seemed as though there was a upward uh, trend, but it wasn't statistically significant. But we're just looking at the data, it looked like maybe you, you could make a case for a nonlinear trend um, because there were a cluster of points that were lower kind of in the 90s. And then after about 2000, uh, it looks like on average, we're getting higher discrimination. Um, and um, so if you estimate a model that just has dummies for different decades, contrasting the 19 before 2001 to later, um, it does look like there, you can make a case there was kind of a jump in discrimination levels against Middle East, North African uh, people from the Middle East, North African region after 2001, right? And so, you know, you probably don't have to think really hard to, to think of what happened in 2001 that might have affected this. Um, and you can imagine that the uh, September 11th attacks and then um, kind of the politicization of issues around immigration and Muslim identity uh, it seems like that has had some effect on employers. Uh, and uh, so there's evidence that there was this kind of level increase uh, in the uh, in the decade between 2001 and 2010. And again, putting controls in doesn't really change that. Um, okay, so then the last thing that I'll uh, go through really fast is um, combinations of country and group. So, uh, um, so here I looked at countries, groups, but you could look at specific countries in there's specific groups in specific countries, I should say. And, um, you know, so I particularly pull out country group combinations where there are a larger number of uh, studies and look at trends for those separately over time, especially to see whether, you know, for instance, maybe there are very different trends for uh, African uh Black origin people in France versus people from the Middle East, North Africa region in France. Maybe they would be different trends or something like that. Um, okay, and so this is looking at uh, Black and Latino for the U.S. In both of them, there's there's a slight decline for uh, Hispanic, uh, Latin, uh, Latino people in the U.S., but it's not statistically significant decline. And there's on average a little bit of an increase, which isn't statistically significant for um, for Black people. And then for France uh, as well, we see that, in fact, there's trends downward both for African Black uh, immigrants and for Middle East North African. Uh, and you can see the, the uh, trend actually looks slightly sharper for Middle East North African, even though that group does not include that one outlier, or one kind of outlier in the X dimension that, that I noted before, the one early study for France. Uh, for Great Britain, we again see very similar trends between African Black and Asian. This is mostly South Asian immigrants in this context. And uh, for the Netherlands, there are increases for both of the two groups that we have enough to kind of separately break out. Um, so in general, we find a pattern that, you know, there isn't really anything that we find where it's like one group goes way down and one group has a really different trend within a country. It, it looks like instead the trends look kind of the same. Um, Okay, and this is just more, uh, uh, you know, showing that in a different way. Okay, so, um, so you know, we come to maybe what is a slightly uh, depressing conclusion, uh, which is that we really can't find evidence of a decrease in race, ethnic discrimination in hiring over, you know, the past 20 or 30 years in most of these countries. Um, and, and there's actually small upward trends in five of the six countries, but it's not statistically significant in general. Um, the one country where there's statistically significant increases in the Netherlands, but I feel like, um, you know, in part, I don't want Dutch people to hate me. Uh, and also, um, uh, I think the data doesn't support the idea that the Netherlands is like very different. It's like there's a slightly steeper trend upward um, and um, it's statistically significant. But a lot of the other countries have upward trends that are not quite significant, you know, so it's it's just like a little sharper in that one country. Um, the exception, which is kind of interesting, is the downward trends from France, but it's it's worth keeping in mind that that's from what was an unusually high level of discrimination to a level that looks more comparable to like what's going on in Great Britain, the level of discrimination in Great Britain that we find. Um, and um, I'm not sure why that is, but I've heard interesting speculations that, you know, maybe something about 
uh, growing numbers of second generation uh, uh, people in France. Some of those, for one thing, are, are themselves employers and probably don't discriminate or discriminate at a much lower level against members of their own group are showing up somewhat. Uh, and maybe too, there's more acceptance to uh, uh, kind of diverse France, at least among some share of the population. And maybe that's helping too with the change in the kind of composition of the French population. But I, I don't really know. These are kind of guesses as to why we might have found this trend. Um, and the other thing is that there's significant increase in discrimination against mean and minorities after 2001 contrasted to the 1990s. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, limitations to this. The data, we, um, so we stopped data in 2019. We didn't use data from 2001 or 2020 or 2021, which were the COVID period. And the reason for that is because we thought COVID might change things about hiring discrimination. And there also just isn't that much data yet that is available that was in the field during that period. There are a few studies, but there's not that many. So that's not included here. So this is going up to pre-COVID 2019. Um, you know, we can't really detect things like short-term fluctuations. We don't have enough data. And, um, you know, these are entry-level jobs in the mainstream labor markets. Um, to the extent there are ethnic sub-markets that are important, those probably are not really getting captured here, you know, so if there's a separate ethnic-only employment market in a country, that's not getting uh, picked up. Uh, and the minority groups that are included in these studies are, are not like a random sample. They're groups that are larger and also are usually thought to be more likely to have been um, targets of discrimination. So um, anyway, this uh, these results uh, us, uh, definitely provide uh, you know, another exception or uh, to the idea of in uh, kind of modernization theory that there are kind of natural processes in um, Western societies or culture that will tend to just drive down discrimination. You know, that these are ascriptive bases that are kind of on the way out as we move towards a society that's really focused on things like level of education, uh, which, is, which is indicated on the CVs of almost every field experiment. Uh, and um, um, you know, we don't really we find no evidence that, that that's going down across this period of time. Um, you know, it is distressing that changes in attitudes, the legal frameworks against discrimination, which have been at least somewhat strengthened, and uh, human resources type procedures regarding diversity haven't produced what we can find as kind of an overall decline in discrimination. It's possible that things like maybe those have mattered some, but they've been counteracted by um, uh, you know, things like uh, the rise of far right groups who are, uh, you know, who, who cast immigrants in a very negative light and who cast racial minorities kind of threats to the country in some cases. Um, and we also find evidence from, from the, the jump in discrimination that political events seem to matter. Um, and I think there's other studies too that seem to suggest that political events in the larger environments can affect the, de the decisions employers are making. Uh, and it can result in more uh, discrimination. Even though employers, you know, you might, under one story, you might think they're unaffected so much by politics because they're worried just about their bottom line and who's going to be a good employee. But that it seems like that's not happening, that these political events are affecting who they're hiring. Um, uh, so finally, I, I guess I conclude saying that, um, you know, we still need to uh, uh, consider discrimination a serious problem across all of these different countries. Uh, and uh, we need initiatives that somehow can push us down the level of discrimination that's occurring in hiring. And it's not just the U.S., it's also Western Europe, uh, Canada, where this seems to be a problem. Okay, so thank you. Please.